the first person who called me back uh, called me to their office. I rented a car and went to their office, like very excited because I'm like, oh my God, I got a call back from like some agent or whatever. And I had like my monologues prepared. I was like so eager, ready to like do it, prove myself. And then the person sat me down and basically said I should quit <laughs> based on my face. So they had not, because they never seen me do anything. So he had just seen my face and he felt so strongly. I mean, it's very funny to me now, but I cried on the way home at the time. But he was like, I feel so strongly that you're not going to make it. Deadpool, Miracle Workers, and now Seven Days. Karn Sony is killing it. We are about to hear a roller coaster ride of stories about how he went from living in New Delhi, India, prepared to inherit a role in his father's John Deere tractor company, to becoming friends with his childhood idol, Daniel Radcliffe, otherwise known as Harry Potter, and writing and starring in a film that just won the Independent Spirit Award for Best Feature Film, Seven Days. This is part one where he talks about finally landing an agent, sort of. And what happened next? At USC, there was a lot of child actors who like weren't big stars, but had been like acting since they were kids because they lived in LA and then they were going to college. So I ended up just like sitting down with a few of them and I was like, how did you make money? And like, how do you pay for college using like acting back in the day and everything? And it all came down to like getting an agent. And so then that summer between my sophomore and junior year, I went to Samuel French Bookshop, which is in the Valley, doesn't exist anymore. This is in 2009 or eight. And um, there used to be an agency handbook, which was a hard copy book you bought that had the address and phone number of every agent agency in LA. Um, and I literally got that. This is like what someone told me to do. And then I got clear envelopes so uh, that I could put my headshot in them, but with a plastic side on one side so you could see through because someone told me if you just send a regular envelope, they'll throw it away because they can feel it's a headshot and they won't even open it. And so they were like, but if you have a clear one, at least they saw your face because <laughs> there's nothing on the resume, you're right? Because I'm like a college student. I don't have any legitimate credit. So um, I mailed it to, I think, 150 places. Um, which is, or every place that was in that book. And then three places called me back at the end of that summer. Um, the first person who called me back uh, called me to their office. I rented a car and went to their office, like very excited because I'm like, oh my God, I got a call back from like some agent or whatever. And I had like my monologues prepared. I was like so eager, ready to like do it, prove myself. And then the person sat me down and basically said I should quit <laughs> based on my face. So they had not, because they never seen me do anything. So he had just seen my face and he felt so strongly. I mean, it's very funny to me now, but I cried on the way home at the time. But he was like, I feel so strongly that you're not going to make it off of your picture that um, I just want to save you like a lot of heartache and you're young, like do something else with your life. And I just remember it was so bad because, you know, when you're that age, it's you're so immature in so many ways still like I was like bragging to all my friends like in college I was like I have a meeting <laughs> and then I was just like crying on the way back oh. and then they were like how was it and I was like good yeah it was really good and I like, didn't tell anyone the truth um then the next place that called me was a husband and wife duo and they called me to their place in the valley again and they were like please prepare a monologue and I just had this horrifying experience where it this person had never even seen me do the thing I was meeting them for, which is act. And they just stole me off my face that I will never make it. So it was just such a jarring like moment of like, wow, okay. Um, so how do you even know what I can do? And so then he didn't even care. So this other place was like, do a monologue. And I was like, okay, like I can do something here. Like I can, I can work with this, like whatever. Did, a, did my monologue. Then they were like, oh, great, great, great. They were like, go wait in the lobby. Let us discuss like how we feel. And I wanted it so bad. And like, I was like, I hope they liked it. And they called me back in. This is like a whole psychological game they were playing. They called me back in and they were like, great. We we both discussed it. We both, you know, debated a lot and we think we want to take a chance on you. And I was like, oh my God, like I almost again started crying for like good reasons. And they're like, here's the paperwork. Just like go fill this out in the lobby and then come back. And the first page was like height, special skills, like all the stuff that you they would need. The second page was bank account number, routing number, um, all this uh. stuff. 
and I knew enough from, again, all these child actors who I'd spoken to at USC who were like, never pay someone to be your representative. It's like, not okay. And I was like, okay. And so then I went back and I was like, hey, um, so what's this <laughs> page? And they were like classic, like in an abusive way. They were like, good job. Like, you're so smart. Like, uh. no one asks these questions. And then they were like, the thing is, you know, we're going to work so hard for you. And so it's not even going to apply to you because you're going to work all the time. But like, if there's a month that you don't work, we're going to transfer like $250 or something from your account to ours because of all the hours we spent like trying to get you work. But they're like, again, it doesn't apply to you because you'll work all the time and I just knew that something was like off and so then I was like "Uh uh-huh um and then they were like do you want to fill it out now and their eyes got really crazy and big and they were sort of like feeling like I was slipping from their grasp and I was like I was like I think I need to call like um my bank I don't know what these numbers are like the routing number and stuff so they were like why don't you do it right now in front of us and I was like no no I think I'll go to the lobby and they were like no do it now and I was like no I think I have to go to the lobby (laughs) just like almost like my memories I walked out like backwards in the room. <laughs> and then they started calling me the wife started calling me and leaving these voicemails and I was just driving back to college like uh, avoiding these calls and then the voicemail started with her being very sweet and she's like hey sweetie like we came onto the lobby we can't see you and then it got more and more aggressive and by the end she was like you'll never work in this town again and you've burned a huge bridge and like we're and it was so oh scary my God. So those are my first two experiences then the third place that called me was legitimate but they only wanted to sign me for commercials which is very normal because you don't really need a lot of credits to be in commercials and often commercials they're just looking for a certain look because some commercials don't even have lines and so you, you can sort of they can submit you for more things and it's more legit, easy to get in the door and so I met this person for commercial. And the thing they said to me was, they didn't ask for any money. It was all legit. But they were like, have you seen Slumdog Millionaire? And I was like, yeah, yeah. it had just come up. They were like, good. Because they were like, that's why we're signing you. <laughs> I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, you know, that's like people like Indians now. So you were going to sign you. And which is so racist now that I think about oh it. But at the time, I was like, God. so grateful. I was like, yeah, it's a great movie. Like, yeah, 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 sure. But I was like, what if that movie had not come out that summer? Like, they would have just been like, we can't find you anything. Um, but that's how it all sort of started then. And then while I was in college, I got my first two jobs. And so I was able to make a little bit of money. So then when I was about to graduate, I went back to my parents and I was like, I know I'm going to have to work at a restaurant. I know I'm going to have to do other stuff. But look, I've made, I'm already in SAG. I got like a little bit of money. Like, it is possible. And so it eased their stress a little bit. Okay, that's major. Like, first of all, I love the way you like methodically approached because the thing that everybody knows is there's no formula, right? Mm -hmm. To make it in in entertainment or at least in Hollywood, there's no formula. Everybody will tell you that. And but you were like, I'm going to figure out the formula. And then you did (laughs) figure out the formula. And you did, like, yeah. I did love that. So you weren't just like hoping that, th- that it would happen. You went out, you did your thing, you figured it out like yeah. in a very logical way. Yes. And then, so this, of course, that's not, you're not the only person who, with talent who was told you're never going to make it. You need to go yes. do something else, which is insane. Why are so many people telling other people that? Like, yeah. there is no reason to tell yeah. somebody that no matter well, what you think. I have my theories on it. It's more like my therapist theory, but I think a lot of times these were all like very low level agents who are struggling in this system of like, you know, this where like their clients, when they do get successful, lead them, which is what happened to me when I left my first agent because it just didn't make sense. Like they couldn't get that kind of opportunities that I was ready for and things. So it's, I do feel for them because they're in this place where they're, how do they bet on like who they can work on for free? Because they may sign someone and not see a cent from them for years or ever. Yeah. And then they know the moment they get something big, they're going to leave because there's all these bigger places waiting. And so I think what happens is when they've been oppressed in their own career and, and way, and this is true for so many oppressed communities and people, you want to take it out on someone. And so it's not right, but that's what they do. I think that's where it comes from is they want to feel powerful somewhere in their life. So they, you, they do it on people that are young and have, want to have their dreams come true, which is so sad. Yeah. Um, But I think it's, it's very common for that reason. Well, I think that's very insightful and it does, it does make a lot of sense. 
I happen. I was a therapist before I did this. So oh my I'm god, I love go that. Ahead. Oh my gosh. I'm gonna go Wait, ahead and validate that. Okay. And say yes. <laughs> Thank you. Wait, let's hear about that. I mean, maybe your listeners already know, but how? What made you switch out of that? So I, uh, I didn't even start as a therapist. I started in college. I studied accounting, but that was never mm-hmm. my thing. I was not into it. Like, could you ever see me as an like working in an accounting firm? No. You seem quite like capable, but I think you would be miserable, but I can see you being good at it. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. But I was, I would be miserable. So I just, I initially, when I was growing up, I was into TV and film, like very mm. into it. So I was always mm-hmm. thinking I would, I would be in entertainment, like producing or something. I didn't really know what, I just knew sure. that I was like you, I was into what goes on behind the curtain. Mm-hmm. So like, I remember going to, I remember my mom taking me to a filming of a TV show in the city. And I was like, whoa. And I kind of feel like that was what started it all. So I always wanted to see like, but what happens behind the scenes? I'm still Mm -hmm. fascinated. Even though I have literally interviewed hundreds and (laughs) some of the biggest (laughs) huge names and I'm friends with many people. So I feel like I, I, you know, like I, I have my hands in it now, whatever. But if I'm driving around and I see Mm -hmm. a yellow sign with an arrow that says base camp, I'm like, I gotta go check it out. What's going on over there? What is the scene? What is being filmed? Mm -hmm. And what can I see behind the scenes? So I always kind of had that fascination, but I ended up landing into like a business and accounting degree because of like a mix up with what classes were available. That's uh-huh. how it wow. happened. Oh my gosh. And then I I knew I didn't like accounting. I worked at a bank for a bit. I got a job with Comedy Central, but it was still crunching numbers. It was in their mm-hmm. ad sales department. Mm-hmm. Didn't like it. And then I would listen to these like radio shows, these call-in shows where a psychiatrist Mm -hmm. would give answers to problems. And a lot of the people I worked with would sit down at my desk and just tell me all of their problems and I loved it. So I decided to go to grad school and I went to Columbia and I got my master's and I opened a a private practice. I Uh did that for a bit. I started writing on the side, kind of like you in the sense that I wanted to write a self-help book because they were like very popular at the time. And I was like, I feel like I could do this. Let me figure this out. So I did my research on how do you get published exactly? Mm -hmm. I sent out a book proposal to like a hundred, maybe not a hundred, maybe like 30 literary agents. And about three of them got back to me and said, nice idea, but you've never been published. So how can we publish you? Hmm. Like we don't know. (laughs) I know, it's such a class. Yeah, it's like, well, then, okay. Right. (laughs) So I started, so I was like, okay, let me get published. So I started writing for magazines, for newspapers. Mm. I started local. And then I wrote for magazines and I kept going up, 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 up. And then I would interview actors and do profiles because that's just kind of, I like interviewing. Yeah. My editors would know I was good at it. And I would start, I would, if I was going to decide who we should feature, I'd be like, well, what am I watching right now? What show do I love? And mm-hmm. then I'd pitch Edie Falco, let's say, because of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Nurse Jackie. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then it's just, I started a show after that, as things yeah. started to change. And you stopped doing, you stopped practicing. Uh, yeah, or, I don't, yeah. I haven't practiced in years. Do but you miss it's that total, at all? Or it, but what? Do you miss it at all? Or are you like happy to be able to I love this. So yeah. to me, it kind of like, I get to use a lot of it. Mm-hmm. And I maybe the one thing that I, that I like about therapy that I don't get now is that mm-hmm. I don't get to regularly see people over and over yeah, again. Right. I do like that. So sometimes right. I keep in touch with a lot of the people I interview, but it's not the same as always seeing somebody and seeing how they're doing and cause I am interested, you know, yeah. but this to me is fun. Yeah. Have you read, you probably have this book. Maybe you should talk to someone. I have not, but that came out a few years ago, right? Who wrote that yeah. again? I, uh, who was Lori it? Gottlieb. Um, I feel like you would love it because she was, she has similarity, but not really, but she was, uh, used to work at NBC, um, as an executive. Yeah. Well, it seems like everything added up for you. Like, thank God what happened with your, your dad, he didn't get his dream. <laughs> and then the John Deere and all that yeah. worked out. Cause you're no question. You're in the right zone for who you are. Don't yeah, you think? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, that's really interesting you're saying that because you're finding me in a very uh, emotional moment in some ways because I just lost a job that I really, really fought for over a scheduling conflict of three days. 
Um, and I've been having a really, really hard time coming to terms with why it's happened um, because it feels very senseless and cruel to me. Um, it was something I auditioned for like six times. And, and when I read it, like I felt it in my bones, I was meant to play this part. And, and then it all came down to a three day overlap actually with Miracle Workers. And so um, it just didn't work out. And so I've really been struggling with like, why did this happen? Like one thing could have been a week earlier, a week after and I could have done it and it could have happened. And I'm constantly trying to remind myself that there is some other lesson and something else here that is at work. And it's so hard because you want the answer now and it may come in a year, it may come in five years or it may come next week. But like, I have been really trying to remind myself of like, you will end up in the place where you're meant to. And even though it felt so right, like maybe it wasn't, I don't know. But yeah, I'm trying to remind myself of it's all these When stories. you're in the weeds of it, you can't see it. Even if you try, maybe you'll get a glimmer of it, but later you will yeah. see, yes. you don't know yet what you're gonna see, but you, yeah. there is gonna be something to it. It's funny, it reminds me of this, this thing. Sometimes I post little things on Instagram and one, I think last week was, stop asking why is this happening to me and start asking yourself what is this teaching me mm. so similar a little different yeah. but similar yeah, yeah, yeah. it's true that everything like that mm -hmm. is a gift in a way and it just yeah. depends and i know that that's your your tendency is to look at things like that anyway yeah. to figure yeah. them out and gain some kind of insight yeah so and i normally can this one has been so hard because this also weirdly creatively happens sometimes and actors and different people will describe it but not everything, most things you read, you're like, I can make this work. I have some ideas. Like I can, this will be interesting and good. And very few times you read something and you literally have an out of body experience. It's almost a spiritual experience where you're like, I am meant to say these words or be in this. Like it just feels right. And it's only happened to me three or four times in like a decade plus. And I've been very lucky to work a lot. And oftentimes like you'll work on a job and you'll find like interesting things will happen. But very rarely do you read something and you're like, I was meant to be doing this. Like, and it was with that. And every other time I've had that feeling, it's always worked out very smoothly. And it's been exactly the experience I thought it would be sometimes even better. And this had all those pieces. So it's the first time one of those things has not worked out. So I'm just a little bit reeling from being like, I thought I understood a little bit of this world, but it's like showing me a different side of it. And so there'll be some interesting lessons, I'm sure, from it. So you got the job and you yes. just can't do it? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, miracle yeah. workers won't bend a few days for you? They did They did do it and then it still came down to three days, yeah. And it's really not the fault of the show at all. Like this is another Hollywood thing is when you sign on to a TV series, it's in first position, which essentially means like they are compensating you well enough that they get the first part of the schedule, like they get the first say. And it's also because TV is stricter. There's an air date they're trying to meet that's hard to change and all that stuff. So I really have to say like they were they went above and beyond trying to make it work and really came down to a COVID situation too, where um, essentially the shoot could have worked out. But nowadays productions require additional weeks after the shoot for COVID weeks. Um, in case there's a shutdown that you're still available oh. and so it wasn't even real shooting days it was three COVID days of like which may or may not even be used <laughs> and oh. the film was shooting in a town of 25,000 people and I was like I don't think we'll get COVID here but I was like I'll shoot myself up with another booster like what can I do to make you I was like I literally won't leave my apartment like what do I do but it just came down to the insurance company would not approve unless I could give two full weeks. This is another example of how Hollywood is changing. Two full weeks after the production in case they had any kind of shutdown. They would not, um, they were not okay with me going back and forth. The miracle workers is like, we'll be okay with you flying back and forth and making it work. And and they did everything they could, but beyond like pushing the show, which is really expensive and hard to do. And so and doesn't give them anything on the show. Like right, why would right. they incur that cost for no reason. So anyways, it's all to yeah. say that. There are a lot of people involved. It's a big thing. I get it. But yeah. look, I'm going to, I feel like this is going to, you're going to look back and be like, yeah. that was the greatest <laughs> thing. I, and here, maybe, I don't know. This is, I don't want to like ruin what it's actually going to be, but for who knows, maybe something's going to come up next that you yeah. wouldn't have been able to do if you're doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Or it would have, uh, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? But yeah. I, there's there's something. Yeah. It's going to be something. something. I feel yes, it. Yes, that's true. Yes. Um, All right. Well, you yes, were such yes. a pleasure to talk to. Thank you yes, so much for doing too. this. Thank you so much. It's so fun. Wait, there's more in part two. Karin talks about meeting his childhood idol, Daniel Radcliffe, hanging out with Steve Buscemi, making miracle workers, and writing and starring in a film that just won the Independent Spirit Award called Seven Days. There's a link to that in the description below.
If you liked our talk, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more real talks with your favorite actors and celebrities. I'm Kara. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.